And we're back again with John Huntington. If you've clicked on episode two, then I'm guessing you're up to speed on episode one. So right back into the action with New York-based sound engineer, author, educator, and all-around interesting guy to know, John Huntington. Uh, are you uh, at your school? Are you getting mostly? Uh, are you mostly folks coming from high school, or what's your what's your uh, typical student look like there? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. We have about 300 students, um, and you know, my friends at like theater conservatories like 300 students because they usually have you know 20 or 30 right. technical students, something like that. Um, our students, the average time, uh, the last time I checked, had been a while, but to finish an associate's degree in our school was about six years. So, the you know, our students are not, I don't think that's all true of our department, but by the college. So, a lot of our students are working. A lot of them are, are first or second generation immigrants that have to, they're the only translator for their grandmother, or they have to take their uncle to the hospital or whatever. Uh, it's astonishing, like, the the stuff that they get through. And there's a lot of these kids grew up in the city under pretty rough conditions, but then they come in and uh, figure it out. Um, so we get them um, sometimes straight out of high school. We get some people move here that found the program somehow. Sure. We get a lot of transfer students, you know, and the, we have really had uh, students that come in from other programs where they do like a year or two in a conservatory and then come to our school, do pretty well. Um, uh, not we're not like going out and poaching people, right. but the um, so our students are all over the place in terms of that, and it's really kind of exciting because the also from like a diversity perspective, the our school is something like eight or ten percent white, and uh, you know most people you know like me came up in the industry through middle class white people, and we're seeing our students come in from all you name every background you can imagine are all coming in, and they're all like this is cool, I want to do this, and they're bringing in all that. You know, and they're also it's really really cool because they're like working on some crazy show in the Bronx somewhere with some you know star from Puerto Rico I've never heard of, and they're like a whole sound company I never heard of, and they still have the same professional standards, and they're doing everything you know they they want to do it of course the way we all want to do as best as possible yeah. with their resources and like a whole world like I didn't even know about so that kind of stuff ha happens all the time, which is really exciting. So when you show up at your school, do you uh, are you breaking people out into different uh, uh, focuses? If I came and said, "Hey, I'm I'm a sound guy. I want to I want to learn what you guys do." What would the path be? Uh, it's a good question. We feel pretty strongly that you still need a broad background as much as possible. So everybody that comes in has to take a basic class in, in uh, scenery. Let's see if I get them all: scenery, lighting, sound, uh, video production, and then uh, that's the. Ba I'm sorry, I feel like I'm skipping one. Um, and then the they also have to take like entertainment controls, which is the networking class, and health and safety and electricity and a lot of those things. So they all have to have that foundation. And then uh, as they go through the program, they have to pick two concentrations. So even if you just only want to do sound, you still also have to take lighting or scenery uh, or video or one of the other areas. Um, because I think, you know, for me, like I got out of school – I, like I said, sound was all analog. It was really intimidating to me. And I went off and did, uh, actually worked on film special effects for a couple of years. And then I did some lighting stuff and then I uh, wrote for a magazine and I worked for a lighting company. And then I actually kind of came back around to the sound where I've been, you know, for, uh, God, the last 20 years or whatever, still doing a lot of other stuff. So we really believe that broad a, that, you know, when you're 19, 20, 21, you may not know where you're going to end up eventually and B. uh, the the broader your background is the more marketable you are and the um you know that that way also and, and also like i said you might discover that oh i over the years i really like doing video more or whatever and you can get other areas so we feel like that foundation is really important but we do they do specialize into those two uh this they i call them track modules they call it sure. um into two modules by the end of their degree and then we have some electives that are um uh, are really fun and you can kind of focus in like I oh, actually teach the uh, show control is uh, we're, we're actually in the curriculum process right now moving that just, just as an elective and uh, that one you actually learn uh, how to program an animatronic character and media and which is a really interesting thing because you got to make a soundtrack you have to program the lighting you have to do the movement all come into one thing and then be able to sort of network it into the thing and control it so and then they also learn media manager which is this overall uh, uh, show control software 
um, and then some other ones as well. And then QAB, of course, is, sure. is throughout the curriculum with that. So the um, so it's kind of it's broad on purpose, but they do sort of drill down and focus in by the end. Have you noticed things have, have uh, dispersed from the kind of the central Broadway out further in New York? Is there is there more important work happening out further out now than than ever before because of the technology? That's a good question. I don't know if it's um, you, you know I think sort of still like the highest level stuff or the most prestigious stuff is still in Manhattan, sure. whether it's on Broadway or it's some you know Madison Square Garden or Radio City or whatever. But there is so much stuff you know throughout all of New York now. It's just kind of I can't even keep track of it anymore. And like the number I I do just for fun I do a lot of music photography and the number of venues every week that some friend of mine is like hey we got a gig over here I'm like where is that like I'm you know somewhere deep in Brooklyn I'd never been to before. And in the old days, it would have been like pretty sketchy to go up in that neighborhood. Um, but yeah, that, that and there's some sound person there mixing it and there's some, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's really all over the place. So, so my, my original question to get to you was you've done so much over the years. And I, I wonder if you have any advice or if you give any advice to your students as, as you're working through a career as a freelance or if you have different interests. Obviously, you do photography, you do all this other stuff besides just being a sound guy, um, what would your advice be for dealing with with the personal side of that, of booking gigs, taking on new relationships without fe- feeling like you're spreading yourself too thin? I, I, a lot of times, even struggle with taking on commitments too far in the future because you're involved in one project already. And do you have any advice for how to move through a career without burning bridges or without missing out on opportunities that, that might be interesting to you that come up? Well, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh... I think you know, I my whole family are all like workaholics, so we're probably not the not the best example of that because I and I only now in like my 50s I'm like you know what I'm not gonna do that because I I know that I would get in because when I get into a project like I don't um, you know I'm in it I don't I don't do it halfway so uh, I can so that also means I can burn myself out and not have a personal life or whatever so um, but I and I think part of that is I've had uh, and he says, yeah, this is true. The entire time in those 29 years here, I've had a full-time job the entire time. And while I've been doing that, I've written the book, you know, actually five editions of a book. I've done all the consulting work. I'm actually going to work. Uh, I, I program this uh, bus at Radio City for the Christmas show. We're actually going to update that this summer. My friend was just talking to my friend about that the other day. I mean, I've done, like I said, I do YouTube stuff. I did the Tribeca Film Festival for a long time. Um, but... I, I can't say – so to me, I, I've never really been made my living as a freelancer. Uh, I've been fortunate in that I've had a full-time job that was interesting, and then I was able to pick and choose sort of side projects that I really wanted to do and was passionate about. Um, and uh, But I think the key thing, and I think you know this uh, intuitively in this business, is the it's all about people. It's 100% about people. And you, I, I do tell my students, like, if you're the most expert – moving light programmer in the world or whatever and you're an asshole you're not nobody wants to work with you. you're you gonna be the last one that they call um so i think that's really important i try i don't think i succeeded all the time but i try really hard to be nice to everybody uh just a to be nice to people but then if you wanted to be cynical about it um uh you should also be nice to people just because someday you don't know where they're going to be where they're going to end up uh all that kind of stuff and i think that's and then also you know, these days it's so easy to get in touch with people. I think we met because I saw her YouTube video and sent you a comment and then I saw you at NAM and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's get out, you know, a lot of people, I'm definitely an introvert. I think a lot of people in our business, the technical side are, it's very difficult for them. I know it was for me to like march up to somebody and, uh, and, talk to them at whatever but just know that they're a geek just like you and that they, they do this because they love it and they love talking about this stuff and we just been rambling on about, i can talk for hours about this crap and everybody i know is passionate and uh and that's and also i think um that's a, i'll get on a topic seven but i want to mention that so we just did at my school <clears throat> we did a stage lighting super saturday uh, which this guy Scott Parker has produced for a long time. It's the first time we hosted at the school, and they had a you know a whole panel of Broadway lighting designers come in, and uh, and I spoke about networking for 15 minutes, which is really hard to talk for uh, 15 minutes. But then I see you know 
the students are like after the panel the these are you know it's uh big broadway light, working broadway lighting designers and these are people you know uh these aren't all our students there were some of our students mostly were, were actually working the event and there was a lot of students that came from other places and here's these broadway lighting designers and you know there's like two people talking to them and there's a hundred students there so i think that's the thing it's like you don't know where it's going to lead and just go up and introduce yourself and just say hey i really enjoyed your talk whatever um and if you're not comfortable doing it in person, do it by email, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is, Snapchat, any of these things. Uh, these people are available. Then you don't know if they have a job for you, whatever, but just go meet them. You know, the, uh, I think that's really important. And then I think the key part of it of, of all uh, is that you have to be passionate about it. As you know, you know, standing out in the rain after some 12 hour day on something, it can be really hard work and really challenging. But if you, I still get that excitement, you know, in the opening, <clears throat> when the thing opens and the event comes off and it's, everything goes great. Like, uh, and I also think that, that feeling is amazing. And I think, those people that thrive on that are like all of us in this industry are also amazing because I think <clears throat> there are people that kind of like, we're going to do this thing, you know, barring a real true disaster, you know, whatever happens, we're going to get through this and get to the other side and make this event happen. And those are the people, you know, you want around you. Those are the people, if you're going to be in a plane crash on a desert island, those are the people you want around you because like, okay, well, here we are. Let's, we're going to move on and do it. Um, and then also, I think from a sound perspective, I, every sound person I know, uh, uh, I'm not a musician, but I mean, music is a huge part of my life. And I, one of my favorite things is like you sit backstage with, with five sound people, uh, you know, almost every time you're talking about, oh, I saw this band and this and these guys played and this blah, 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 blah. And, and we're still, you know, I can't, I can't perform like that, but I just be around that scene and, um, and take part in it. It's just such an amazing feeling. So it's worth it, all that. But, and then the one last thing I'll say about it too, is that, you know, I always tell my students, like, um, <clears throat> I actually said this at that stage lighting super Saturday. It's like, it is intimidating when you start out, but you already got a network, right? You, you have your group of people that came in, um, whatever you're doing, whether it's high school, college, or just working on a show or whatever, that's your connections, but you got to maintain those connections. You know, that's the, in the old days, you know, I had a Rolodex, actual Rolodex, and then I had like a text, you know, computer version of that. I don't know, I had a, like a big thumb typing HP thing, but I'm, I, you know, I'm terrible at phone numbers and stuff, but I, I've kept in touch with people, you know, from throughout my career. And now, you know, I'm still amazed sometimes, like I was sitting on a conference call uh, for the ETCP uh, certification, we're updating the exam like a year ago or something. And I was sitting there like, this was like, now I'm talking at this thing. And one of the people on the phone call was my boss and sort of mentor from the lighting company, you know, that was like, a, it's a legend in the business and all that. And like, I'm, you know, discussing something that I know a little bit more about than he does, uh, just in the network. So he knows way more about a lot of other things than I do. But <clears throat> that just all of a sudden, you know, 20 years later, that's where you are. If you're, you just stick out and you're passionate about it and keep those connections. I think that's really important. So. I'm sure you've started to, but have you started to run into your students, your former students out in the field? Is, is that, uh, is that happening? And, and what's, the, yeah, what's that like? It's pretty cool. The, um, I haven't, the last couple of years I've been so busy with the haunted house and stuff and like these, these things like the YouTube and the Tribeca, um, film festival stuff I used to do every year all dried up or went away for various reasons. But the last YouTube event I did, uh, we were in the theater at Madison Square Garden and I walked on stage. There's literally four or five of my alumni there uh, working on the gig that had nothing to do with me. They were there That's working awesome. for World Stage or on the house crew or whatever. And like that was cool. And I think the, the best, one of the best compliments I ever got was I was working on this um, uh, Tribeca Film Festival outdoor uh, uh, event. This is a long time ago, and it's all local one. I'm a local one member uh, from working at the Met, and I and I uh, keep. I'm not giving that card up, you know. So, um, but I had a student who was working on the local one call came up to me. He just said, "I just wanted to thank you." He said, "I always thought you were an asshole because you're so rough on it, or not rough, but I pushed this so much, and now I see why you're doing it because out here, like." that's the way it is and you gotta you have to perform and stuff and uh and he was like i you know i, I just i i wanted to thank you for that i was like i was that was like the best compliment i ever got because uh, not that somebody told me they thought i was an asshole but but the, just like hey this is what you're doing was that's the way the industry is and i think our whole 
at my school, I think all of us really, you know, we're very much about that, that, it, you know, it's about this is what the industry needs and this is what, uh, how you have to act in the industry and stuff. This video is made possible in part by our good friends at Electro Sound Systems. If you want to see what goes on at a real working live sound shop, their YouTube channel is for you. In the shop, on the job, and on the workbench, they're taking you along for the fun at electrosoundsystems.com. Yeah, we certainly don't succeed all the time. And uh, we'll see things. I even see one of the things we struggle with is with our students is like they have two full semester classes in electricity. And then two years later, they can't remember Ohm's Law and stuff. It's like, I know you you had this. You pass an exam to get there. You can't like. So this is the thing we struggle with. Like, you know, and then, you know, the students that are passionate about like, oh, this is so cool. They're going to do it, but we're an open admission school, so we don't get, you know, a lot of the other schools, they pick and choose who they want in there based on, you know, who's the most uh, passionate or whatever. But for us, like, as long as they're succeeding academically, they're in our program. So, uh, you know, we're telling, look, look, if you want to succeed in this business, you got to be driven and passionate about it, you know. But I do think you can, you can work out a, a work-life balance, you know. Uh, I think, and I think that's becoming the awareness of that is becoming an even uh, bigger issue these days as people are like, Hey, and also I think as the, I think this is all part of this uh, technology's maturing too, is that the, uh, it's like, look, you know, this isn't a, always a science project anymore. It's just like, we know how to put this in. We're going to do it. It's still going to take as much time as you got, but it's like, you know, putting whatever this thing is together it used to be like, well, we've never done this before. Oh, oh, we don't have the right bolts. We don't have the right cable, whatever. But it's like, no, now it's a standard thing. You just put it in and then that leaves you more time to really polish it, program it, cue it, whatever you're doing. And that, that I think also means it's more predictable for us in terms of that stuff. I should just say very quickly, I think that's an important thing that we really, we have some constraints in the way that we work in our building because the building's just not open on Sunday and stuff like that. So our students cannot, you know, like the way I did in college, you can't stay all night sure. and finish the thing. You have to have it done. On, and I think that's uh, some conservatory programs still operate in that sort of old way where there's the resources are never really managed very well. And I think that's something, you know, again, we don't succeed all the time, but, uh, you know, we, that's an important, really important thing for us is that I think that's an uh, important thing for students to get the idea that, you know, when you're in the, uh, on a commercial world and people are being paid by the hour and there's overtime and stuff like that's a very real consideration you have to, uh, think about and learn how to manage that stuff. So. Sure. Yeah. A lot of times I know on our, on our job sites, when we're dealing with these bigger shows, a lot of times it comes down to crews that have nothing to do with us. It'd be yeah. security or oh, yeah. the rigging guys have to be off the call. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting when you get out in the real world, what the priorities uh, change to, yeah. and it has nothing to do with the, the audio or the work you're doing. A lot of times right. it's completely. Well, and, again, that's, and that stuff is for us to, you know, that's where, where our passion shines through is like, it doesn't matter what's going on. You still want it to sound good or look good or, you know, whatever you're doing. Uh, and that I think is, it's, that's sort of like the given in our thing. And if you have, you know, like you said, you can't get the trucks unloaded or whatever. It's like, okay, but we're still going to, we're going to do this over here. We're not going to construction industry. They go, ah, we're going to, we're off to go home today, come back tomorrow. It's like, there is no tomorrow for us, you know, right. got to get that showing. What do you have coming up next? What's your big uh, 2019 uh, thing we should know about? Well, the the yeah, the sabbatical from or which they call fellowship leave in my in my school it you know it's not it's a break but it's not a vacation right so you have to propose work so I propose several articles that are all in the works right now so I'm hoping to get them out in the next few months uh, and these are things the real the reason I applied for the leave was like these are ideas I've kind of had half baked in my head for a long time and I'm really uh, I needed time to research them and work them out um, so that's that's my big focus the moment um and then i'm going to usitt this year uh and then, but i'm actually going to leave and go to the haunted house show which is the so the usitt is in louisville and then it's in st louis so if anybody's i'm going to be over there for a couple of days if anybody's going to either of those shows um we're going to do a pretty interesting thing every year my friend jim uh who's a show control guy uh for he can never say who he works for but it's the large theme park in orlando <laughs> You know, he's a contractor for them, uh, working on very cool projects. But he and I, 
uh, most years we do this thing called the Geek Out uh, during Infocom, and that's about show control stuff. But this year in particular, I think um, we haven't gotten it together and announced it yet, but the, what we're going to do is talk about time code because there's a lot going on in that world. Like we, we and I were both at IAPA this year, the theme park trade show, and everybody we ran into, we ended up talking about, are you using analog, you know, old school time, not analog, but, you know, old biphase time code or are you doing something over a network or are you syncing things just with separate clocks and all that so that's sort of the plan is to that'll be our our geek out this year is have a couple people do some presentations on that and have a big discussion so if anybody from all sides is interested in time code and you're in orlando for infocom uh, i'll get all that up on my site when we figure it out um definitely do that and then when i get back then i'm uh oh and also the big thing for me somewhere in may there i'm going storm chasing so i'm waiting to see how all that shakes out um that's why i'm pushing to get all my writing done early in the spring so i can be free to go off and drive five thousand miles or whatever um and then we're gearing up we're actually making a bunch of changes in the haunted house this year so i'll be working on that uh, over the summer and then that gears up again next fall so anybody that's listening that you're interested at all uh, come see this haunted house it's like 10 bucks all the money goes right back into the the project and um <clears throat> and the cool thing is though when you exit you can see all the technology operating. So we've set it up. It's not locked in a machine room somewhere like it would be at a theme park. It's out. It's available to see because you can talk to our students that are operating it and stuff like that. So that's really – and then uh, anybody, if you want to see a managed network in action, you know, that's there. If you Dante, uh, uh, sensor systems, uh, lighting, video surveillance systems, all this stuff. Uh, we have bright sign players, all these things. Uh, are all built into the system. You can see it all, you know, you can look behind the scenery and see it while it's running. So I encourage anybody to come out and just ask for me if I'm not there, just ask for a student, you know, to, to answer whatever questions you got. So That's really exciting. I'd, I'd personally love to come up. I'm definitely going to plan to come up on the train and hopefully uh, catch up with you there and, and check that out once you've got definitely. it up and running. Thank you again cool. so much for your time today. I, oh, I really was appreciate great. you taking the time out, and I hope we can do this again genuinely. This is a lot definitely, of fun. Definitely. No, it's here. definitely fun. Yeah, and I had um, an old friend of mine who I saw at the uh, smart class actually this year was telling me he was leaving there, and I, he um, he does these – I don't know how he got involved with these things, but like um, right after the, our, the class, he was doing a gig I think in a hospital – where it was going to be Dante because he needed to get sound from here to there. And it just, you know, it could run a lot of cable down the hall or you just tell the IP, IT people, I want a VLAN from this jack to this jack with nothing else on it. And that's, or two of them, you know, so main and backup. And that's the way they were doing it. And a friend of mine that um, does that Clinton Global Initiative every year, which is like this, I don't, I think it's not happening anymore, but he did it for a long time with stuff just spread out everywhere. Again, you just build a big Dante network and then click, 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 you patch wherever you want and stuff comes out. So it just makes it so, rather than, oh shit, we need it in that room. I got to run a malt down there, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it changes everything with that. We're on the cusp of something happening like that in video. So uh, Dante or they they, um, uh, they demoed that at Infocom this year. They were patching video and they just made an announcement in February at the ISC in Amsterdam about it. I haven't seen it. I'll see yeah. it at Infocom this year. I think they're selling a chipset now that will do that. So it maybe is not going to be what you need for a video wall. Like at NAM, our session at NAM. Uh, my friend, who uh, he couldn't say what it was for, but it was in Cupertino, so I assume it's from um, some massive video wall thing where he was bundling eight 10 gig fibers together to get enough uh, bandwidth for the pixels he's doing. So it's 80 gig per like feed wow. to a video wall, uh, which is insane. Yeah, yeah, so, that's... but that's what video needs when you have that many pixels. You know, you gotta it takes that. But anyway, I think for basic, if we could just get like basic 1080p video that you could patch like Dante, you know, there's a lot of competing things. There's this like software defined video rethernet. There's this NDI thing. But, uh, you know, if somebody like Audinate can get into that market and they're pretty shrewd about that stuff like that, that'll change a lot of stuff, too, because then you could just run one network and then, oh, you need video here. Oh, you need this screen. You need this feed. Boom, 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 boom. It's done. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah, yeah, but it does mean there's a job somebody like sitting on the laptop now, like patching stuff, and the paperwork is really important and all that. You know, 
and the last time I did that YouTube gig, like <clears throat> they, these guys were kind of old school guys and they had two CL fives and all this stuff. And they were really scratching their head looking at the Dante controller, you know, it's like, but that's the way you do it. You know, yeah. you really want to run, you know, 40 XLRs between these two things or just these two cables, you know? So it's, it's the future. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Well, I'd, I'd love to get catch up with you when Dante, when the uh, alternate uh, video over Dante kind of gets a little more time behind yeah. it in the next few months. Cause yeah, it seemed pretty exciting. Do you go to NAM or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Infocom? No, no, not yet. I'd love oh, to, uh, but I, if yeah, you fine. can get down there, the, the, it's in June in Orlando, which is the worst time to go to Orlando, <laughs> but yeah. that means, cause it's just miserable, but that means flights are cheap and the hotels are cheap so if you can get down there it's definitely worth it because it's it's uh for the last four or five years i mean i used to go years ago when it was like film strip projectors and then there was like the video shootout was very cool but now there's actually like usually like meyer and people like that that's where they do their big demos now because it's cheap like I, i've heard the last line array that's where i heard they do a lot of product introductions there and so the live sound component is really big and then the video stuff is like it's just incredible how much stuff is going on with it. And the, um, uh, so if you can get down there, it's worth it. It's like the Thursday of Infocom week is when we do that, um, geek out thing. So if you're, I'll get that date together in the next couple of weeks here. Um, and if the, uh, that thing I think would be interesting for anybody, cause it's going to be, like I said, this year we're going to talk all about time code. And we used to do this as like, we did it out of the eye for a long time. And then we did it some other places. And then we're like, people, we're mostly just presenting to each other. Why don't we just do it ourselves? So we found somewhere we can end up canceling last year because my friend couldn't make it out. And I was busy. Um, but usually um, we just find some conference room somewhere. Somebody buys us some food or whatever. And, uh, and then we just like present to each other. And uh, it's been really, really interesting uh, presentation. You usually get like most of the people doing these big, crazy show control projects all around the world are there. So it's, uh, it's really, it's pretty interesting in terms of that stuff. And I should send you, uh, I always have to look that guy's name up, but we, at school, we, uh, the Yamaha book is, I, unfortunately is not, well, it's kind of old now, it's but it's also old, not, yeah. Yeah, and it's not organized well enough to really use in a classroom. So we used this book by this guy Stark for a long time. It was very good. But evidently he, like, left the business and stopped doing it. But there's a new one now that I just found. I really – I don't know whoever his publisher is is not uh, marking very well. It was really good, and I cannot remember the guy's name at all. But I'll – uh, remind me when the email is and I'll dig it out and send it to you. And I ended up corresponding with a guy cause I had, a, I had like, I went, I didn't read the entire thing, but I had like two things that I, I, he still gets like phase and polarity. He didn't really clear those up. Right. Um, but I was like, Oh, I'll get it in the next edition. So then we've been using that with our students and the only, it's actually a little too complicated for basics, but that means the information's there. So that's another guy you might want to speak to. And I think he really needs help pushing his book. I don't know what happened when I think he just sort of wrote it and it's right. some Canadian publisher or something, but it, I, it was very hard to find. And when I found it, I'm like, Oh, here, this is, you know, yeah, it's hard to find stuff on, especially on live sound and, and just pro yeah. audio in general, it's very difficult to find. I mean, it's hard to get a hold of print books in person. Anyway, you right. have to kind of go online now to do it. And yeah. Yeah, it's tough to know if they're actually going to talk about anything relevant in, you know, when you actually yeah. get a few chapters in, is it actually worth the, you know, they're not cheap either. So, um, yeah, and then the other problem is a lot of them tend to like, oh, I'm going to talk about everything. So they'll have, you know, how do you deal with people on the bus and what's it like to deal with a crew? And then it's like two pages on, on uh, you know, microphone construction. It's like, well, the that's a different book. You know, like, tour life, that could be a book, but I think the sound – so this guy actually – uh, focus on the fundamentals, and I think that's the the best one I've found in recent years. I don't even remember how I found it, but it wasn't like in the old days. You had mixed bookshelf and stuff like that it was really a good resource, but there's nobody sort of curating this stuff anymore. Yeah, you've revised your book a few times, and you I know you've mentioned that you take things out occasionally if they become obsolete or you know they don't seem like they belong anymore. Have you thought of doing like a a supplement of just obsolete? stuff in a book as a reference yeah i probably wouldn't do it just because the uh the amount of sell well <laughs> right and it's just the amount of time it would take but all my old books are still around and uh they're at least the last two are available on google book search 
uh, I don't know if the other ones, because those are the ones I that I published. Then they're, they're, the the publisher never put them up. Um, but yeah, there's certainly because it's interesting that. But I mean, well, it's interesting because like the first edition had a lot of stuff on like serial and all that, which is now. I mention it now, but I don't really go into it because we don't do it that much anymore. But there, I would say there's a lot of that information. You know, like Wikipedia and stuff is pretty good for that. Yeah. Um, and the the web now to find you know the Pioneer Laserdisc protocol or whatever is is pretty good for that. So I probably wouldn't do it in a like written thing, but I think it is out there. And it being, I used to, it's funny because the early days of my website in like ninety something. It was actually like a compendium of like lots of information um, and companies and people that made things and all. And over the time, I just stopped. Up- Once we got Google took over everything, I just sort of stopped updating that and deleted it eventually. Um, but it is kind of interesting, like that older stuff. Um, you know, other than like I said, my book is like a moment in time and those things. And those, they're still out there. Yeah. But the um, – yeah, it's an interesting. It's an inter- I don't know. It's an interesting world with all this stuff. It's great in so many ways, and then the other ways, it's like, wow, what are we? You know, how does this work anymore? Yeah, yeah. When it comes back around ten years later, it's oh man, what were we yeah. thinking back? Then? <laughs> you know, yeah. So. <laughs> but I do think I really. This is one of the premise of the article that um, the next one I have to write is more. I really think like I would wager right now that networking and you know maybe IP version six, probably not. But networking, like, and then in 15 years, we're still going to be doing it pretty much the way we're doing it today because it gives, you know, maybe those edge cases where the guy's running 80 gig, you know, there'll be something new for that. But it's going to be IP. It's going to be Ethernet frames. It's going to be this stuff like this stuff isn't changing. So that's really amazing because that's exactly what you're saying. Like 15, 20 years ago is not the case. Like, oh, there's this protocol with this thing and it's pinned like this and then that's gone. Yeah. Now there's the other one. Uh, but now it's going to be, you know, RG45 connectors. I think are going to be around until yeah. I'm dead, right? They're not going away. And I address is all the same stuff. Yeah, it's, it's really hard going back looking at technology, especially from the 90s and things to, you know, things surrounding that when, when it comes back up and you're trying to just figure out how much of what they talked about actually ever got implemented right. into, the, into the protocol. And it's tough to figure right. out because, you you know, I'll go back and find papers on it that, man, this thing solves every problem in the world. And then you start digging into old forum posts and say, well, no, it didn't quite do that and it didn't quite do this and it did this, but there's an exception. And, yeah, it's it's, it's fascinating to, to keep and, track of how standardized. And like you said, there's a, such a foundation now of, of good quality technology that yeah. we able to build on in, in all the different areas so and i would say specifically on that topic i have a section of the book called the limitation of standards that addresses that exactly because when i was younger i was like oh and then like mini show control was coming out in the 90s I'm like this is it you're going to be like the easy way to control everything in the world it's all there like one protocol and then you know i had a friend of mine who was older at that time uh, uh, video and staging guy, <clears throat> and he's like, mm, "This isn't the right way to do it." And now, like somewhere along the process, I flipped to his way of thinking because, and I write it. I'm basically just stating what I wrote in there. But the two things for a standard is one, there has to be a real need for it, and like pulling it into existence, and two, it has to uh, cut out a uh, cover a very limited set of things, because exactly that this I and he's, and the reason I think I came to understand that was watching these protocols fail. So mini show control was was great, but no one ever used it, and now it's used to trigger lighting boards. It's like the only people left using it, and but it, it was made to run everything on a show, and no one ever did that because it, it just then it becomes you know, uh, mediocre for everybody and optimized for no one. So that doesn't, that doesn't help you. So the, um, and there was a couple other things like this media link protocol, which is actually in an old edition of my book and stuff that's long gone. I've seen that so many times over and over again that I think that I, you know, that's what it's really got to be a very narrow thing and be fairly limited in order to be a succeed or something like Dante. Actually, Dante is a good example of that. It's proprietary. <clears throat> Just carries audio, maybe video that will be separate. Uh, you get it. You just get the thing in, and then with the this is the argument I had. This could be another hour about ACN and stuff. <laughs> but the um, ABB, sorry, too many acronyms. Sure. Yeah, um, seriously. The uh, I keep telling them it's like, look, for the average user of this stuff, something like Dante. Well, me when I picture Dante, I think of Dante controller, grid screen, and where you're patching and stuff. So uh, 
which is very different from you think about like a snake like if i picture what a snake is i'm kind of picturing electrons flowing through this thing or whatever yeah. but me if i think about dante I and mean, i might think about signal flow or whatever but i'm like oh dante controller right i patch from transmitters to receivers blah 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 there is none of that in abb yeah. Right. That that's what I keep telling. Like, I don't care if it's a hundred times better. Even if it's sound, there's no sound difference. But whatever it is, <clears throat> um, they they don't have Dante controller for AVB. So it's not even. And so the average user, it's sort of like telling somebody, well, this has you know five more horsepower than that. But you're thinking about the steering wheel and how it drives, and they're talking about like some you know engine management feature the computer or whatever so that i think that's the big problem with abb and stuff is like people aren't uh there there is no unified interface for anybody yeah so and then if it's all like meyer uses it and that's it that's okay and then i asked them like i actually asked them infocom this year um they're like oh we're doing really cool stuff with uh abb on metallica and all that i'm like oh that's cool how are you getting signal in from the console? And they're like AES3. So that means they're taking, you know, from the huge console, which is probably has some network, they're running, you know, two channel on an XLR digital audio from that into their controller. And then it goes out into another network. Yeah. Really cool. yeah. And I think it's fine in that case. Like that's a reasonable dividing line between the console and the speaker system. Like that's okay. Really, it should be a network. It should be AES67. Right, but Meyer's not putting that in. It's like, and they're none of those other guys. But some of the other, like El Acoustic, those guys do make Dante solutions. Meyer doesn't. So it's like, can't you even? I understand if you want to put a wall there, that's okay. But at least make it so you're not like patching XORs between these two systems. It seems kind of crazy. Oh, just one last thing before I forget. I have a student. We're actually waiting. I was hoping to get it yesterday, but uh, I have a student that I'm a uh, senior class project that he's working on. Um, and we're, we compared that. I, I don't know if I talked to you about this already, but we do a double blind listening test between a CL five and a Behringer X 32. Oh, cool. So um, the <clears throat> just straight into the, so we're coming in analog into the board using their ADD. That's all the time we have in this video. We will absolutely be hearing more from John in the future, though, as well as making it a priority to get up to New York this fall to visit the haunted house. Let us know in the comments below if there would be any interest in maybe doing a meetup this fall in New York at the haunted house with John and the crew. Uh, if that's something you'd like to do, uh, if there's enough interest, we'll definitely organize it and we'll get a whole bunch of dollar pizza in and make an afternoon out of it. Thanks again for watching, subscribing, and and making these videos possible. And also thanks again to John for all of his time and knowledge and being so generous and sharing it with us here today. I'll see you again next time.